We are live. Welcome. Oh, look, thank you so much for your patience. Um, welcome to another of the In Conversation series. And this is part of the Leadership and Influence stream. And it is a pleasure to welcome a longtime acquaintance, in fact, Reverend Dr. Bishop Caraway Durgu. And as we pick his brains, glean some insights while we spend some time together over the next 50 or you know however long we've got um good morning and uh, well actually good afternoon now welcome bishop caraway thanks so much for being part of this conversation thank you, thank today. you so much my brother matt it's so good to see you <laughs> you're looking you're looking younger than the last time i saw you <laughs> that's very kind of you and uh well actually on that it, i um i served as a, a lay member of the team at st mark's tollington park in the yeah, early course, 2000s I, uh, I remember you very well, very clear. That's why I'm saying that you look younger than the last time I saw you. Because I well, was at St. John's logging it away at that time. Yeah, you remember. That is right. So uh, we came up to visit you in St. John's Holloway and um, and we had a wonderful yes. session with you. And uh, yes. I just, I just, I mean, let's go straight into that. I just wondered, what was your biggest um, learning during those years in Holloway? Because that you were a local parish oh, wow. minister, minister. Tell us about that. Yes. There's so many, there's so many things I can list on this uh, in response to this very, very, very good question. First of all, I think the biggest thing I learned was the power of prayer. The power of prayer. We discovered, we dis we dis we de developed a dictum in St. John's that goes like this: Talk to God about the people you want to talk to about God. You get it? Yeah. And we yeah. learned that we learned that if you if we had to pray about the people who wanted to reach for Christ, yeah, before talking to them about Christ. Huh. So that the Lord will prepare the grounds and prepare their hearts and open the opportunities for us and give us the way in to talk to them about the best news in the world. So I found that prayer was the biggest thing for, for us as a church. So we put a lot of our efforts into praying. And we started small as prayer meet, as a prayer meeting, a prayer group, and it grew with time. The other thing which I found very helpful was building relationships. Building relationships in the parish and within the church in a multi-generational sense. And we found that our church family was made up of people of all generations. So we developed a universal priesthood of all believers as the scripture teaches, because everybody had something to offer from the grandmas to the young people. And that was our approach to mission and ministry in St. John's Upper Holloway. Prayer and working in relationships with those God had sent to support the work. Those it's are the one, two big things. It's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We've been talking a bit about prayer at, at our own church just in this season. I, and I, I'm so struck, um, you know, how the early church, they devoted themselves to a number of things. We're told prayer yeah. is one of those yes. things they devote themselves to. And yes. it's no surprise that we should see fruitful ministry coming out of a prayerful ministry. That is so true because, you see, Christ does not depend on our methods or our techniques because he's going to do the work. He is going to do the work through us. So we need to be, like John 15 says, we need to be branches that are embedded in the vine. You get it? And we can do, the best way to do that is through prayer and the word. Mm. You know? It keeps us grounded in, the, in, in Christ, keeps us embedded in him showing him that we totally depend on him for anything instead of applying methods and techniques and strategies all of those will come you know it says in matthew 6 seek ye first the kingdom of god and our heavenly father who knows all the things you have need of will add them to you the same applies in our ministry as well yeah yeah wow hey look um bishop caraway uh, just think about discerning god's voice Yes. Um, you've got a lot of experience with this. I'm just thinking particularly at this time, there may be, you know, the kind of year that we've had, um, people's schedules have been, um, 
you know, disrupted. They may be thinking about the bigger picture, about their, their you know, what they want to do in life as they think forward. So just thinking about discerning God's voice. How did you know that you needed to move from being a doctor into ordained ministry? Thank you very much for that lovely and very interesting question. I've had this question asked me so many times. I grew up um, by the grace of God in a church where we were discipled and discipleship was a big thing for us. And I think the church is lacking these days in not being effective in discipleship of young converts. And one of the things we learned in our discipleship was to walk closer with God. Because when we looked at all the examples and the models in Holy Scriptures, we saw amazing examples of men and women who walked with God. And one of the things we found out very early on, as I said in my first answer to in the answer to the first question, they were people of prayer, like you said about the apostles. They decided that they were not going to be attending to tables and techniques and strategies. They committed themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You get it? So first and foremost, we all have to be grounded in our relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the three in one and one in three. And one way of doing it is to be grounded through prayer in our personal relationship with Christ. And that will be fed into by our daily, regular meditation and reflection on the Word of God. You know, my friend, when I was in university, was studying to be a doctor, had a big caption in his bedroom in the student's hostel, and it said these words, make sure you receive marching orders from the commander-in-chief before you set out today. Hmm. You see, so, so many times, quite often, we do not commit our ways to the Lord and depend on him. So many of us try to depend on our own understanding and refuse to acknowledge God in all that we do. But the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, that we should trust in the Lord with all our heart and commit our ways into his hands. And he will direct our paths and we should not lean on our own understanding. So what my wife and I found from very early on was through prayer and meditation and reflection on the word of God, we learned how to be in fellowship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how to listen to him through the scriptures and through the revelation of the spirit by word of knowledge, by word of wisdom, by direct impression on our hearts and on our spirits, what God was saying. Because the words that God speaks to you would always be consistent with his revealed word. The revealed word would always be consistent to what God tells you prophetically or by lead, the leading of the spirit. God never contradicts himself. So as we prayed about our future, we started to pray with our prayer partners. That's another thing another level to bring it to. You have to make sure you have friends around you. Surround yourselves with friends who can support you, that you can support and disciple each other, grow together in accountability, pray for each other, and help each other to learn to hear God. You know, the scripture says in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, that at the mouth of every two or three, every word shall be established. That's why Paul said in the Corinthians, when he wrote to them in chapter 14, that when one prophesies or two prophesies, the others should judge whether the prophecy is from God. So we need that context of prayer support and prayer partnership, either in a friendship group or in a church context, where we can support each other by either confirming or of um, testing the words that people have received from the Lord. Because the fact that somebody says the Lord told me to do this doesn't mean it is correct. 
I mean, we've just seen the situation in America where lots of respectable Christian preachers and pastors and prophets prophesied that Donald Trump was going to get his second term. And they all got it completely wrong because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And we're human, we can get it wrong. So my wife and I were in part of the group, we're part of a group and part of the church. The more we prayed about God's leading on our lives, the more convinced we and our friends that God was calling us to do the work he's called us to do. And when the time came, God confirmed the word he had put in our hearts through one or two other prayer partners who were close friends of us and church members who did not know what was going on. And God used them to confirm what God was saying to us. So I moved on from being a medical practitioner, a GP and hospital doctor. I went to Bible college to train for ministry with the support hmm. of my dear wife. I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. And it it's and it's wonderful to hear because it's it's speaks of a, a communal exercise in fact of, often the, the picture of discipleship can be quite a lone ranger you know i'm going to do my own thing but actually it's an there's an interdependence that's so important it speaks of the body of christ everyone playing their part in that process absolutely my brother you see the individual the issue of individualism is a western phenomenon i'm sorry to say it because we have we have we have deified individualism in the West. We have turned individualism into a God. God has made us, each one of us in his own image, to be members of families and communities. Because if you look at the history of our God, theologically, as far back as we can go, God has always existed in community, in the community of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, which we call the Trinity. So our discipleship is a communal and should be a communal thing. And you remember in the Acts of the Apostles, when there was the, 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 the confusion about the uh, who was going to administer food to, the, to the, the, the widows and all that, the apostles said to them, pray and choose from amongst you, right? Pray and choose from amongst you. The apostles didn't just go and choose. The people prayed. And it was a communal decision. The people that were called had a conviction in their hearts and the communities confirmed it. That's why in the Church of England today, we have a selection process. Because it's not enough for you to say, God has called me to be a pastor and therefore I'm going to set up a church. You have to submit yourself to vocation explore, vocational exploration so that other people would confirm this calling or not. That's why it's so important for it to be a communal thing, discipleship, and confirmation of calling. Because there are too many mavericks in the world today in the church who are just doing their own thing and not subject to any accountability or, or leadership because they believe God has spoken to them. That's not biblical, I'm sorry to say. God mm. calls us to submit to authority. So we are all men and women under authority of yeah. the Lord himself and the church. It's it's uh, wonderful to hear these insights. Hey, look, I'm um, just thinking forward, just thinking about evangelism, thinking about that as an area now to to discuss. And I know that you led open air evangelism in your parish. And um, some people might say, well, look, that's a bit outdated. But then you saw great fruit. T tell us about it. Yes. Thank you so much. That's a very exciting question. In fact, it's one of the questions I've still been dealing with some of my priests in my area. You know. Evangelism is not a one-size-fits-all issue. I often say this to my colleagues and those who are prepared to listen. You know, Jesus told the parable of the sower. And the sower went out and sowed seeds. There were different types of soil, but it was the same seed. You get it? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's very foolhardy for us to say, oh, this method doesn't work. That method works. This other method is not effective. This other method is better. I'm sorry, I disagree. Speaking as a missiologist myself, and looking at the history of missions in our world, different contexts have required different approaches. Just as different people 
made of different personalities require different approaches and different sensitivities. So I found in my parish, in the almost 25 years of ministry in, in North London, that some people will respond to street evangelism while others would not. Some will respond to door-to-door -to -door evangelism while others would not. Some will respond to evangelism via the Alpha course or a beginner's course while others would not. Some will respond to the Billy Graham type big meetings, mm. top, big tent top. So there are different methods and we should be prepared as disciples of Jesus Christ to do what the Spirit leads us to do. So in our time at St. John's, we did open air preaching on the streets. We saw fruits. We did door to door work on the streets, door to door, knocking on doors like the Jehovah's Witnesses. We saw fruits. We did over 20 alpha courses back to back we saw fruits. We did we participate in the big top that happened at the Arsenal and the one before that. We saw fruits hmm. because there is no one method that fits all. There's no one size that fits all. And we've got to be prepared as Christians to be open to the spirit. And we also encourage people to do one-to-one -one personal evangelism. And we saw fruits as well. So the growth that we saw in our church family was a multi-factorial, multi-faceted movement of the Holy Spirit. And I say to my friends today, when they say, oh, I'm not an evangelist, I cannot go out and do evangelism. <laughs> in, the, in the church background where I was discipled, we didn't use the word evangelism because in the Koine Greek, in Acts of the Apostles, the English equivalent of the word that was used to describe that was used to describe the work that the apostles did was transliterated as gossiping the gospel. <laughs> they just gossiped the gospel. And in our culture, we gossip a lot. And all the people had to do was to say, Oh, have you heard? Have you seen what is happening? Would you come with me to see? Would you come with me to hear? That, that was all they had to do. And the context was that of a witness who was telling another person what they had witnessed. And so the word material was used, which is also the same word that's used, translated to matter, as we say in martyrdom. Mm -hmm. So the witness gave witness of what they had seen. So when we talked about what you call evangelism today in our church background where I was raised, we called it witnessing. These, our pastors used to say, let's go out and do some witnessing. Perhaps if we change the caption, maybe many more people will be prepared to be involved in it because there'll be no excuse for them to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not an evangelist because every one of us is a witness and we are called to testify to other people what Jesus is doing in our lives. And so that's, that was the bottom line for us at St. John's, to be witnesses of God's amazing grace and amazing testimonies of his faithfulness in our lives to other people. And like Leslie Newbegin, the professor of missiology who did great work in India said that mission, evangelism, testifying, witnessing, is like the case of a beggar who's gone out of the beggar's camp and found food and then goes back to the beggar's camp to tell his other beggars where to find food. And when you put it in that context, people would understand how important it is for them not to be selfish about what they've discovered in Christ. Mm. So, such, such depth there, Bishop Carraway. I, uh, I love that. And, and a really freeing message as well. Some, sometimes we can think of an evangelist as this, have a particular picture in our minds and we think, well, we're not that. So does that mean I'm, I'm, I'm not an evangelist or can't share the good news? But um, there's something very natural and relational about the way that you just described evangelism. Just, share, just sharing what, the good news of God, of God in our lives. Yes, just sharing the good news, gossiping the gospel and, <laughs> and witnessing to what you had seen and heard and experienced. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, 
so you covered off my second question there on evangelism, yeah. <laughs> Bishop Gary. Thank you. So um, thinking about leadership. Okay, so um, leadership requires time for both strategic and operational tasks. But as but as leaders, we're often drawn into the day to day task list. And I just yes. wondered how, in your role specifically, how do you juggle both, keeping making sure there's time to think strategically, but also dealing with the day to day tasks and actions. Thank you so very much for that very intelligent question. One of the challenges I've had as a leader was that I didn't want to be a leader to start with. And all my life, I wanted to run away from being the upfront leader. I wanted to stay in the background. My wife would tell, my wife would tell you that, my friends would tell you. Because in my family of 12 children, I'm the number 11th child. I'm number 11 in 12, out of 12. So you can understand what I'm saying. But God called me into leadership, kicking and screaming. And one of the things I've learned, as I said earlier on, is that every one of us called into leadership are people called by God under authority. We are all men and women under authority. And we have to submit first and foremost to that authority. That is the leadership of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. And as I said earlier on about the caption in my friend's room when we were in university, we have to, first of all, as leaders, as commanders of God's army, as brigadiers, generals, wing commanders, captains, squadron leaders, we must receive our marching instructions before we can lead the troops effectively. Because if we aren't receiving our marching instructions from the commander in chief, then we don't know where we're doing or what we're about. So putting it practically, as leaders, we must make time for prayer and retreat and personal welfare. I talked about discipleship earlier on. Make sure you are making time to build up and grow in your own discipleship in Christ. Make sure you are making time to grow in your friendship with Jesus Christ. Make sure you are making time to grow in the word of God, your knowledge and time of meditation and reflection in the word. Make sure you are making time to spend time in prayer and reflection. So as leaders, we have to start from the basics. Wake up in the morning, spend time in prayer and reflection and prepare for the issues ahead of the day, ahead of you and find out what God wants you to do with those particular situations. Because if you don't receive matching instructions from the, list, the leader and the master, you cannot lead the flock that you are supposed to lead effectively. So that's the starting point. Building on the foundations of our relationship with God in prayer, meditating and reading, reading and meditating on the word of God and making time for fellowship with Christ. You remember what God, the Lord told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1? He said to Joshua, be of good courage. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Hey, but Joshua, listen. In verse 8, he said to him, do not let this word depart out of your mouth. Therein thou shalt meditate day and night to do according to what has been written. And therein thou shalt make to observe and to do according to what is written. Therein thou shalt make thy way successful and be prosperous. That's the basic spiritual rule for all of us. Spending time with God in prayer, meditating on the word and seeking to do what has been said so that the worldly strategies we put in place will be strategies that are of his mind. And Jesus said it when he prayed for the disciples in John 17. He said, stay, abide in me. Because he had taught them in chapter 15, 16 and 17. Any branch that does not abide in the vine cannot bear fruit. Because as we know biologically, 
if the branch, branch is chopped off, then it doesn't have sap, it doesn't have biological nutrients to develop fruits. So the branch has to stay in the vine consistently in order to have spiritual nutrients to produce fruits. So in terms of the tension between leadership and strategy, submitting ourselves to God's leadership as leaders ourselves and following what the master is doing and modeling that for our own leaders who are working with us. And then we can develop strategy and vision that is in line with God's will for the ministry that he has committed to us. But I tell you what the temptation is today. The greatest temptation today is that for so many of us, especially the younger folk in ministry, we make our ministry our gods. And once we start to defy the work, we become idolaters. We become idolatrous in our practice because we have turned the work that is given us into the God that we should be worshipping. Instead of worshipping the God, first and foremost, who gave us the work to do. So my prayer for us is that we will be rooted and grounded in the true vine and be fruitful through strategies and visions developed by the leading of the Holy Spirit and not man-made. Mm. That's been my experience in ministry, and that's what I practice. I don't only teach it, I practice it. So you make time for retreat, make time for personal retreat, make time for group retreat, make time for time of reflection, make time to pray over subjects before you talk about it. Don't be, don't be quick to say, I don't know what to do about this. Let me pray about it for a day or two. That's fantastic to say, because that means that you are a leader who is listening to God. It doesn't take anything out of your leadership authority. It just shows that you are a person under authority, which is consistent with our calling. Mm. Oh, wow. I, I, love, I love that passage. I often come back to John 15 and uh, remaining in the vine, abide in me. And that, that word me can be translated to make your home in. And I, I love that sort of image. And, and, and so you, you would say that abiding um, in, in the Lord would, would involve prayer, reflection, meditation on scripture, um, you know, spending time in his presence. Is there, would there be other things or would that be primarily what, what you would hope that disciples would cultivate and leaders would cultivate? You remember I talked about the community aspect of it. Yeah. You know, because he hasn't called us to be lone rangers. Yeah. That's the personal aspect of it. There's a communal aspect to it. Pray together with other leaders. Pray together with other church members. Spend time in fellowship with other Christians. Because as the scripture says, iron sharpened as iron sharpened iron. So the countenance of a friend, the other. Yeah. Build meaningful friendships with Christian friends who will build you up. Spend time in fellowship, quality time in fellowship with them. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And so if you think, if you balance the individual and the communal, then you're onto something. Because it's not enough for you to say, oh, I'm spending time with God and then ignore the church. No. That's because that's the other problem we have. Many of us develop our fellowships and we ignore the bigger church because we think we're comfortable, we're okay in ourselves. We're not okay. We're part of the big body. Mm. We have to recognize and identify with the body of Christ. Because if you don't recognize the body of Christ, then you're a lone ranger. And it hasn't called us to be lone rangers. It's called us to be part of the community. You know, he said in John 17, I pray that you do not take them out of the world, but you keep them in the world and help that they would love one another as I, as I have loved them. Right? But today we need to show that love to each other because part of loving each other is staying in fellowship with each other, sharing the word with each other, praying together with each other and doing ministry with each other because we need each other as part of the members of the body of Christ. So that's the other aspect of it. And thank you for asking that second part, second part of the question. This, we, we're, um, we're coming to a, to a close with our session together and um, just have a, a question about what you see God doing in this time. You have a broader perspective. Um, there are people that will be listening to this now or later on who are involved in all kinds of work, whether it's in the church or you know, homeschooling maybe right now or 
in education or in politics or just all different sectors of society. I just wonder, from your perspective, what do you see God doing in this in this season, in this time? Thank you so much for that question. That's a very important question. First and foremost, I thank God that we have been blessed to be Christians in this generation. Because we are, you know, the Lord always saves the best to the last. As you, as we say in a real in a in a relay race, you know, in a relay race in athletics, you always put the best runner at the last leg, isn't it? So that you make up for all the errors that the first, second, and third runners have made. And you put the fastest sprinter on the last leg. So I believe that this age that we're in, that will, by the grace of God, usher in the coming of Jesus Christ, is the best leg. And look at the technological development we have available today. The wisdom and technology that is in the world today is unequaled, has never been seen in any previous generation. Look at how quickly we've developed a vaccine for the, the, the COVID-19 situation. So my prayer for us, first of all, is that I've noticed that God is doing something amazing in the church. I believe in this generation that the Lord is developing a church without walls. I believe he's bringing down the barriers that have kept us separate for such a long time. Because in my role as Bishop of Woolwich, I work ecumenically with my fellow brothers and sisters from other denominations. People are beginning to respect the Church of England again, and the Church of England is beginning to respect other people again as fellow partners and fellow stakeholders. And we need that responsibility of care for each other. Because if we are going to work together as an army of God's disciples, like my one of my heroes in the church, in the Victorian era, Bishop J.C. Ryle, said the church is like the national army. It has three divisions. It has the infantry, the navy, and the air force. <laughs> and all three divisions would work together when there's an enemy invading the nation. The Navy will use their fleet on the sea to tackle the enemy. The Air Force will use their airplanes to bomb the enemy, side, uh, enemy territory to disable them. And the infantry will march with boots and tankers and all sorts of things into enemy territory to conquer it. That's how we can see, we must look at the church. So God is uniting the church as members of one body because a body that is divided against itself cannot function. Neither can it stand. That's the first thing I see God is doing in these last days. The second thing I believe God is doing in this age of modern technology is that God is empowering the young people in the generation of our church to take serious leadership roles. It is not that the elders have failed, no. It is because it says in the prophecy of Joel, which was enacted at Pentecost, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, that the old men will dream dreams and the young men will see visions. God is calling us today to step up young people which gone are the days when we say, oh, they are the leaders of tomorrow. Young leaders like yourself, Matt, young leaders like your colleagues and friends who are on this program, God is calling you to serious leadership responsibilities. That's the second thing I see. <laughs> and I think we need to gather our resources together and support you. And all of us will take our place in the role that God is calling us to. And the next third thing I've seen is that God is shaking the foundations of our world because there's always a shaking before a trial and a judgment. Look at what is happening in the world today. All the things people put their confidence in have all been taken from us. Even the very simple thing we call our basic human right to freedom and liberty, to roam and roam freely and go where we want, has been taken from us. You can't just get up and roam and go where you want now. Now it's a lockdown. You have instructions from the government to stay 
at home, except it's very essential. So I cannot just get up, get in the car and drive to Liverpool like I could have done one year ago out of my own choice. Now I have to have a good reason for doing that or else they will, I'll be stopped on the road and sent back home. So God is shaking all the foundations of a secular world. And I believe that people out of that would recognize who the true God is. It's a bit like the situation in Babylon when the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar was shaken, was shaken upside down and Nebuchadnezzar proclaimed God, Yahweh, as his God. That was not the first exposure he had. He had had similar experiences previously. We were warning to him, but didn't change his heart and turn his heart to God. So God always gives us time, gives us opportunities. So my prayer is for us is that all of us as a world will turn to Jesus Christ. The other thing I think God is doing is that we, are, we live in an age of possibilities. We live in an age of amazing things that were impossible that are now possible. Look at, for example, through the COVID situation, 99% of our churches have gone onto social media, either by force or by design, <laughs> because of the situation around us. Guess what? Church membership has grown through the websites, through the internet, through the media, through the social media participation. So more people today in England are attending services than they were before COVID-19. Look, last year, the Bible Society told us about a 40% increase in the sale of Bibles and their materials compared to the previous year. Why? COVID-19. Many more people are seeking for truth. So I said to my colleagues in my area where I will serve as bishop that we should not despise this day because God is doing a new thing. Because whether we have opportunity to do direct church face-to-face -face or church on the website as in webinars or seminars or uh, podcasts or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever or live services, live streaming, Church is church. We have opportunity to preach the gospel. And as Paul said, whatever means by which we preach the gospel, Christ is preached. And that is the bottom line. So that's the first thing. Mm. God is opening up for us opportunities <laughs> that, were no, that were not possible before to reach out to our world with the gospel. Now today you can put anything on the web and people all over the world will respond to it. I was listening to someone yesterday who started a small group on Premier Radio, <laughs> thinking that local people in his community will attend to it. But guess what? People from as far afield as South Africa and Australia and New Zealand are joining in the Bible study and prayers that they've been doing. It just set it up for the local people. That's the age in which we live. The world has become a small village and it's an opportunity for the gospel to be preached. So you remember when Jesus comes, the whole world will be able to see him. And it's all part of the preparation for the gospel. Yesterday was the inauguration of the new president of America. The whole world was watching. The whole world. Because it's possible to do that. So this is an opportunity for us to do what was impossible, to preach the gospel and to promote the love of God in any and every nook and corner of our world. Mm. I think that's a glorious opportunity. And this is a glorious time to be alive. And fifthly and finally, I see there's a new work of the Spirit cutting across. <coughs> denominational, denominational boundaries. You see what the Pentecostals used to think was their prerogative. It's now happening in the main nine churches. Prophecy, word of knowledge, the gifts of the Spirit, you can see it everywhere around you. It's not only restricted to particular, one particular church or ilk of church, because God is doing new things in his people, the body of Christ, not in the denominations. So that's the fifth and final thing, the work of the spirit, hmm. the opportunity to spread the gospel, the work of God through Christ, uniting the church, the call to us, to the young generation, to be stepping up to the plates, 
and the work of Christ in you and you uniting the body of Christ and bringing down the walls and barriers that separate us. I'll just stop at that because there's so many things I can talk about on that set. I don't want to care, I don't want to bore you. It's so good. It's so good. This it's absolutely um it's just gold to hear you share your visibility, your passion and um and sharing your your time with us bishop carrie we're so grateful to you i wonder as we finish uh, we won't have time for q a uh, we've already overrun on on our on our time with you but i wonder whether I'm you could finish about that. no 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 we've we we've uh we we've uh, taken up your time i just wonder whether you might be able to pray with us and for yes, us i'll be happy to pray with you my brother thank uh, you if you if you like to pray and i'll pray as well yes let's pray together if you like to pray mark Pray. For sure, for sure, for sure. Father, I want to thank you so much for Bishop Carraway. Lord, thank you for his ministry. Thank you for calling him into this role at a time like this. At, uh, and, and Lord, I pray that you'd encourage him, bless him. Lord, thank you for the encouragement that he's been for us today and to us. And Lord, I pray that you bless him and, and his family. Lord, I pray for, uh, in, encourage him with kingdom fruit through his conversations, through his leadership, through uh, across the diocese and those that he's leading. Lord, I pray that you bless him indeed. Lord, thank you that your face shines upon him. Um, be with him today. In Jesus name. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord, for the wonderful privilege to be with my brother, Matt, after such a long time. And I really thank you for the work that he's doing and for his team and his co-workers in this ministry. Thank you for Stronger 21. Thank you, Lord, you have indeed called us to be stronger in this generation and in this age, despite all that's going on around us. And I just bless you for the energy of youth, as I've shared today, and the energy and passion of the young people in our church that you've called to be leaders to step into the roles, to have visions of what you would do. Lord, bless and anoint them afresh daily for the work that you've called them to. And help us as older citizens in the church to support and collaborate with them and to work with them with humility and to respect their calling and to work and encourage them as we work with them, not just as models, but as also co-workers and co-stakeholders. Bless and anoint this ministry, we pray, and all who have been listening today. Prosper your work in their lives. Keep them strong in this time of trial and temptation. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep all our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you and all your loved ones and all those whom you think of and pray for today and always. Amen. 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 Absolutely wonderful. Bishop Carey, thank you for your time. God bless you. And uh, you, we, look forward, we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you so much, Matt. And have a blessed day today. And thank you all for my brothers and sisters. Sorry about the technical hitch. The enemy is always like that. He tries to prevent <laughs> us from hearing what God wants to share with us. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. God bless. See you soon. Thanks, you everyone. Soon. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.